Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mustafa. I'm a co-founder at Celestia, which is a modular data availability layer one blockchain. And today I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to present an overview of the landscape for data availability solutions in 2023. But this talk speci isn't specifically about Celestia because I'm going to try to give a, like a neutral overview of the data availability landscape. But that being said, obviously I'm biased, so you can take, take that how you will, but I will try to be neutral. So first I'm gonna discuss what is data availability, a quick brief overview, and then I'm gonna uh, discuss different approaches to data availability and different uh, trade-offs in this space and what the kind of trade-offs between these different solutions are. Because there is no one size, there isn't necessarily one size fits all solution, different applications might want to have different security or performance trade-offs. Um, so what is data availability? So if we recall that all blockchains, including roll-up chains, consists of two main components. The first component is the, is the block header, and the second component is the actual transaction data in that chain. And the block header commits to the transaction data usually in the form of a transaction Merkle route. And the question of data availability asks, um, if you're a node or a program that only downloads the headers, how can you actually check that the data, the transaction data that the header points to was actually published by the producers of that block? Because the problem is if they don't publish, if they only publish the header, but they don't publish the actual data, then no one knows what the actual transactions in, behind that block header actually are. And that can cause various problems for rollups chains specifically. For ZK rollups or validity rollups, data availability is important because if the sequencer doesn't publish the uh, state different, the state changes, or the transactions, then users won't actually know what their balances are. They won't know what the state of the chain is. And that means that it, that kind of like boils down to effectively a kind of like a, an attack where a sequencer can freeze people's funds and, and like hold them hostage and potentially other things like bribery attacks. Like it, 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 it can freeze people's funds unless, until, unless you pay them, for example. For optimistic rollups, it's even more important because Optimistic rollups rely on fraud proofs, and if the transaction data behind that rollup isn't available, then that means that block producers and um, well, full nodes cannot generate a fraud proof if there's a malicious transaction inside the rollup block, because they don't know what they don't know what the transactions are, so they can't generate fraud proofs because they don't know they can't see which transactions are bad. Now, it's worth noting that, because the, there's a lot of confusion about what data availability really is. Data availability is not the same thing as data storage. Data storage is, is more about like making sure that the data is stored in, uh, in a, uh, long term. But data availability is only about making sure that the data was even published in the first place so that storage providers actually have the opportunity to download that data and store it. So data availability is not concerned with long-term data storage. It's only concerned specifically with the question, how can we make sure the data was published just once on the internet? Like how, how, so a better name for it might actually be data publication. So like for example, in Ethereum EIP 4844, data, uh, uh, data is only guaranteed to be stored by nodes for 30 days and then it's deleted because it's only about making sure it's published so that people can generate fraud proofs or users can download the, the data so they know what their balances are. It's not about long-term storage. Now, the interesting thing is that data availability wasn't really a question before rollups because before rollups, um, all nodes, uh, all blockchains work the same way where you have full nodes and full nodes download all the transaction data, and that's how they know the data is available. So obviously, if you have to download all the data anyways, then obviously you know you have the data, 
it was available because you could, you, you could download it. But that's obviously not scalable, and that's why we have rollups because it's not scalable to, to have a system where every node has to download every transaction. And that's why rollups exist because they effectively um, shard execution into different rollup chains. And the main chain or the settlement layer does not have to execute all the transactions in, that ch in the rollup chain. So the question of data availability asks is like, how can, you, how can light clients or smart contracts check that all the data for a rollup chain or any specific application was actually published or was actually made available without actually having to download all that data yourself and check it. So I'm going to give a brief overview of different like data availability uh, mechanisms and their trade-offs. And there's kind of like, I guess, two buckets here, on-chain data availability and off-chain data availability. On-chain data availability is when the uh, when data availability is guaranteed by the, by the layer one network. So like if data is unavailable, then the fork choice rule of that layer one network actually just rejects the block outright. So it's like you, you have a, the data availability is coupled with the actual chain. The off-chain data availability um, is opposite. So data availability is guaranteed off-chain or by some third party chain or by some third party service that is not directly connected or part of the layer one's consensus mechanism. So we just, went, we just talked about the most obvious data availability solution, which is full node download all data. The other on-chain, um, as we mentioned, that's not scalable. The other on-chain data availability mechanism to make, to make on-chain data availability more scalable is called data availability sampling. I'm not gonna go into the weeds of how it works. You could, there's also, there's also material about it online, but the general principle is that block producers can commit to something called um, an erasure coded version of the block. And that basically allows light nodes to download random chunks of the block. And when they download random chunks of the block, then that effectively gives them a very extremely high probability guarantee that 100% of the data is available by only downloading a very small percentage of the data. And this is using this is used like Reed Solomon encoding, which is similar technology that's also used in stocks. Uh, this this is like a very uh, like a new technology that isn't widely implemented yet. It's kind of like it, there's various protocols, including Celestia, Ethereum, and Polygon Avail that's kind of implementing this. Uh, but and there's several like ch current challenges that people are researching. The first one is. Um, in order for data availability sampling to be fully secure, you need to have some network, you, have, you need to have some peer-to-peer -peer mechanism for uh, light nodes, for full nodes to reconstruct the block by, down, by, by downloading the samples from light nodes. So like if light nodes collective, let's say you have a thousand light nodes and they collectively downloaded enough samples or enough random ch chunks from the block, that they can re collectively reconstruct the block if the block producer was, was trying to be malicious and hide the data. You need to have a peer-to-peer -peer protocol for that. And that's kind of quite challenging um, because it, it's, a, it's a unique challenge compared to other peer-to-peer -peer distribution protocols like BitTorrent or, or IPFS because, you, because it's like lots of different nodes have small pieces of the data and you have to kind of like, they have to discover each other. The second challenge is proving that the erasure code was constructed correctly. And there's kind of like two different ways of doing it right now. The first one is using um, what's called the KZG commitment scheme, which is, which is, which is a validity proof scheme. It proves, it, you can prove that the erasure code was constructed incorrectly. But the, tra the trade-off there is that there's kind of the, the, the proving, uh, the times to prove the commitment, what's called the to prove that something is inside the commitment is quite slow, and what's called the KZG opening. And then the second way of doing it is fraud proofs, which are faster, which, which make computing the erasure code and generating proofs faster, but the trade-off there is that you have a, light nodes have to wait a challenge period, usually a few minutes, 
before they can accept that block is valid because they have to wait to see if there's going to be any fraud proofs. And the third way, uh, the third challenge is, uh, in my opinion, the biggest challenge to data availability sampling is light node adoption. Because data availability sampling is only completely secure if there's enough light nodes in the network such that they can collectively download enough pieces of the block such that they can re collectively reconstruct that block. But right now, uh, light node support for any chain other than Bitcoin is extremely poor. Um, this is something that Bitcoin did extremely well. Like if you can download a Bitcoin wallet on your, on your mobile phone, phone that has about 5 million installs, and it's a, light, it's a Bitcoin light client that connects directly to the Bitcoin network. But we don't really have anything like that as, 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 as adopted for other chains like Ethereum or, other, or any chain after that. So a big challenge there is how do we like move away from the MetaMask module where, you not, where, where while it's just connected in Fura, how can we uh, embed light clients directly into, into users' wallets so that we have widespread light, light, node, uh, light node adoption? <coughs> and part of, uh, part of the challenge there is how do you actually bootstrap the network? Because if there's not enough light clients, then the scheme kind of basically, uh, th as I said, doesn't have full security. It reduces to what's called a proof of data retrievability scheme, which still gives you some security, but not as high as a proof of data availability scheme. Uh, I don't have three minutes left, so I'm gonna uh, just gonna go, go to the off-chain section already. Uh, in terms of off-chain solutions, there's kind of like uh, four different kind of mechanisms. The first one is one where there's no there's no guarantee at all, uh, and that's actually kind of not bad uh, for some use cases. Like for example, if you have NFT and the NFT data just points to some IPFS URL or URI, there is no data availability guarantee because there's no guarantee that the the data behind the IPFS URI was actually ever published. But that's actually perfectly fine for NFTs, for example, uh, because obviously before you buy the NFT, you can check is the data for that NFT was actually published. Otherwise, the NFT would be worthless. Then there's solutions that might have a single trusted third party. So you might have like a single signature or a single party that attests to the availability of that data. Um, and this, this is okay for some schemes like Plasma Cache or like Starkware's Adamantium. Because in those schemes, if the data is not available and the single trusted third party lies, the users actually have the power to exit uh, to the L1. But the trade-off there is that this doesn't really work for all use cases. It only, it main, like, it only mainly works for payments. It's harder to make it work for generalized smart contracts or DeFi. Uh, like Plasma Cash, for example, only works for payments. And that's why Plasma was abandoned and in favor of roll-ups. Because you couldn't general, you can't make, it's hard to design mass exit schemes for data unavailability for use cases other than just like payments. There's also data availability committees. And that's just basically like a, a data availability multi-sig scheme where uh, a set of people, a set of, uh, a set of people can guarantee the data availability of some data. Example of that is like Starkware Validiums. There's an honest majority assumption. For, there's a seven, seven, to two, seven to 10 uh, member of the ACs, and obviously most of them have to actually sign the data. And then another example is Arbitrum AnyTrust, which makes a slightly different trade-off. Um, 19 of 20 of the of the committee members have to sign the data. So you get like a higher safety threshold, but the trade-off is that uh, you, have, you have lower liveness guarantees because it's more likely that like if just one committee member goes down, then you, leave, you lose liveness. And users can actually just force transaction inclusion by submitting transactions in the L1. But if there's a mass exodus, it's not clear if the L1 can handle that kind of capacity. And then finally, there's lashable committees, which are like data availability committees, but with some crypto economic guarantees. And um, so like if the data availability committee lies about the data availability, then that means that they can be slashed. 
and that gives you some extra crypto economic guarantees. But you can't do this. You can't do this if the data availability committee is L2. It has to be an independent L1 because you, could, you can't slash the data unavailability on chain. Uh, but you can only um, you can only slash them if it, if the data availability committee is an independent chain. So I'll quickly go through these and then I'll take questions. And an example of that is Celestiums. So uh, it's what we call uh, Ethereum L2 that uses Celestia for off-chain data availability. And thus, the Celestiums can be slashed, uh, Celestia can be slashed if data is unavailable by the light nodes, thanks to data availability, availability sampling. And we can see that for the off-chain data availability landscape, there's generally, it's, it's a wide trade of space. Obviously, roll-ups are the most secure because they use on-chain data availability. But there's a, there's a trade-off between um, gas costs and security level, depending on what kind of trade-offs your application needs. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is about, do light nodes need incentives? Um, and that's, kind of, that's actually related to the challenge that I brought up, is about how do, we, um, how do we have wide adoption of light nodes? So in my opinion, light nodes don't need incentives because uh, like we, we see, if you look at Bitcoin, for example, as I mentioned, there's a Bitcoin wallet that you can download on Android that has 5 million installs. That's, that's a Bitcoin light, light node. Like users, like light nodes have extremely low resource requirements. So like um, you can embed one into a wallet without like really, without the user even noticing because the, res the resource requirements are, are so low that um, to, to the user, it's just a wallet. Uh, so to me, the problem is really how do you incentivize users to run it? Because users will download wallets anyway. They download MetaMask, they download Bitcoin like wallets, so on and so forth. The question is how do you embed a light node into MetaMask? Um, because it's a, it's a browser extension. Or how do you encourage people to download desktop wallets, or, or, for example? Yeah, but I mean, then you're still relying on the, whoever's designing the flight yeah. to embed this thing in their voluntarily, right? So, which is fine, but it's not guaranteed in any way. Yeah, well, uh, so the, 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 the first thing to note is that the security, the first of all, light nodes are something that benefits the user. Uh, from a security perspective, but secondly, to guarantee the security data availability scheme, you only need an honest minority. You only need a small number of light nodes to for all the, for the, all the other light nodes to have security. So, for example, like uh, the, like you're, we're talking about like a, few, a, like a few hundred light nodes. Like if, as long as you have a minimum threshold of light nodes, then that can guarantee, that guarantees the full security of the data availability scheme. So, and that only needs a few hundred or like a like a, a thousand light nodes. So we don't necessarily need a million, millions of light nodes. So in my opinion, that's not really difficult uh, to get as long as there's an option. Yeah. Sorry, can you speak louder? Yeah. Uh, is the question, what do I think of Protocols like Eigenlayer, which separate data availability into separate, separate module. Uh, yeah, so I think I guess the question is about like um, separating consensus from execution. Uh, sorry, separating consensus from data availability. Uh, well, actually, so that what Eigenlayer does is they separate um, kind of like co consensus from peer-to-peer -peer networking. But I don't really know I don't necessarily think you need to you need to separate that uh, in order to get the benefits of. Uh, what Eigenlayer claims, which is an increased peer-to-peer -peer network. The main, um, I mean, the main benefit, the main reason why Eigenlayer claims higher throughput is basically because um, they don't, yeah, they, they, it's, it's not because they don't do consensus, but it's because they don't, uh, they use KZGs, uh, which means that they claim that the, the, the node operators don't have to download, they can do sampling instead of downloading the data. So, 
So it's more about KZ, KZ, using using KZGs than separating the, the availability from, from from consensus. But the, the main kind of trade-off with eigenlayer is that um, you can't like the uh, they use ETH restaking, but you can't slash ETH, you can't slash data unavailability on chain. So the ETH doesn't actually contribute to the security. What they ha what they instead have is a dual, a dual staking mechanism where the eigenlayer token is slashed um, if data, data is unavailable. Okay, uh, that's, I'm out of time, so thank you, everyone. Oh.